ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be here uh, this evening to discuss a topic like Scotland in 2030. You know, what will we become? What does the future hold for us? Uh, and it, to me, is extremely timely to look at that at, at a point in our history when we're obsessing over some really key political issues in the here and now. I, because I believe our eyes being taken off the ball. You know, these issues that we're uh, being asked to spend every waking moment, it seems, uh, contemplating, which are undoubtedly very, very important for us, uh, are nothing close to as important as the issues that are going to be raised by the technological changes that are fast approaching. And 2030, I think, is a reasonable line in the sand to, to look at. Um, but the fate of many of us sort of futurists or technologists is that we always either predict things to be a bit later than they actually come or a bit earlier. So I'll put a health warning on everything I say tonight, which is none of the dates I tell you will be true. Um, you know, I'll, I'll get it wrong by some kind of factor either way. So I'm holding my, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not being held to account for anything. I sound like a politician at this point. <laughs> yeah. um, in, in all seriousness, though, you know, we... I believe some of the challenges that we're seeing in, uh, in society today around, you know, rise of uh, what some are calling, uh, you know, Trumpism or, you know, populist politics are attributed to, uh, to the wrong, you know, to the wrong reason. Uh, you know, they're attributed often to petty nationalism or, or protectionism, fear of migration. And that's the things that people look at and go, yeah, that's what's causing the problems in my life. I can see that, um, and I don't believe that's true um, at all. In fact, I believe already some people are suffering from being disconnected with the technological future, uh, but not realising it, blaming it on, uh, you know, on migration or, or other things that they can see closer to home or on the front pages of their newspapers. Um, and in fact, one of the things we need to watch as we career on into this incredibly exciting future is that we don't leave too many people behind, because we've left behind kind of almost approaching half the population as it would seem today, by the time we get to 2030, we'll have left behind the majority of the population if we're not careful. And some of the things that will happen, undoubtedly, um, are related to societal changes driven by technological change. Some of the biggest things we'll see over the next 10 or 20 years uh, will be around autonomous vehicles. You know, I'm lucky enough to drive a, a, a Tesla electric car, uh, which... You know, a decade ago, the autom automotive industry told Elon Musk, one of the founders of PayPal, uh, that he was crazy. He was an idiot. You know, he, what did he know? He came out of, you know, some electronic payment company and was actually, you know, arrogant enough to stand up in front of, uh, you know, the whole world and say he could design a better car than the automotive industry that had been doing it for 100 years. And he published quite openly how he was going to do it. And they laughed and said, no, not possible. In fact, actually what you've done is you bought a bankrupt company, which Tesla was, um, you know, based on an old British chassis, a Lotus chassis, they'd done a prototype. Went, you know, that's, that's laughable. You'll never do this. You'll never make a car that can sell for the price of a, you know, a luxury sedan, do 250 miles of range, you know, be practical. Uh, you know, it just won't happen. And they laughed and laughed. And then suddenly he released the car and everybody took a gasp with a gasp of amazement. He delivered it and then they said, oh, he'll never be able to deliver this in volume. It will never happen. And on Elon Musk and Tesla have gone to where today uh, the Tesla Model S in California, its principal and primary market, outsells Lexus, BMW, Mercedes and Audi combined in that luxury category. All the big three German manufacturers plus Lexus, I think plus, I don't know that there is a, anybody else in that luxury market, but they've wiped the floor with them because it's a better product. Its components are more reliable. They did things that were completely counterintuitive. They said, oh, it's a three-year warranty, the same as everybody else. And then three months into production or release of the car, Elon Musk tweeted out, the chairman of the company tweeted out, uh, oh, by the way, everyone, your warranty is now seven years. You know, now, what company on this planet have you heard of that post hoc decides to give you a longer warranty once you've bought the car and paid for it? Why would he do it? Well, he did it because they looked at the component failure rates and said, wow, we've got rid of the engine, we've got rid of the gearbox, we've got rid of the fuel system. Actually, there's not a lot to go wrong in this car. 
You know, let's, let's make it even more, you know, let's take away the, the uncertainty that people are worried about this new technology or the battery will go flat, the battery will, um, you know, will, will run out its lifetime and it'll cost a fortune to replace. That was the dogma that was being put out by the auto industry. Guess what? They just wanted the battery for seven years and said, well, what do you want? Well, do you know, as well, we'll replace it. If you, if you need it replaced, we'll replace it for a couple of hundred quid. Um, and suddenly, everybody started to, pardon the pun, but their gas was put at a bit of a peep. Um, <laughs> subsequently, you can now see that industry too slowly trying to react to Tesla, saying, well, we can do it. We can do it too. Yet they can't quite do it. They can't quite adopt, adapt and adopt those technologies at the kind of pace of change that someone like Tesla or a company like Tesla can. This year, Tesla will release their Model 3 uh, car. And, you know, again, the humour of Silicon Valley, they kind of had the Model S and then this big SUV giant car that they brought out is the Model X. So they decided that they were going to release the Model E to put in the middle of the two. Um, and Ford stopped them because they'd, uh, you know, they'd... Uh, they, they trademarked Model E uh, some time ago. So Elon Musk just, just responded and said, well, we'll just call it the Model 3. Have you never texted anybody uh, before? <laughs> um, so so they, you know, they've got this kind of really interesting corporate culture. And everybody thought they were a car company. And then suddenly this year, they, everybody realized they're not a car company. They're actually an energy company. You know, they've, they put these cars on the road that, in case of mine, has a... a talk technically for a moment, as an 85 kilowatt hour battery. It's massive, absolutely massive. Could probably run my house, which is not a, a unfortunately, particularly eco-friendly house. I could run it for about a week on the power that's in my car. So actually, if you think about that, I'm holding all the power for my car that I might have charged up when I was on the road in my garage when I don't need the car. Actually, I could borrow the power from that. I could sell it back to the grid. Companies like Iberdrola are now starting to take that seriously and realise that distributed power networks are not about necessarily nuclear or renewables start to make far more sense when you've got some place to store the energy. Well, in your garage is a pretty decent place to do it. Then they've released batteries for the home. Then they've announced, and if you go and look at this on, online, it's absolutely beautiful. They, it's a strange thing to say about a roof, but they've released solar roofs. They've released tiles that look like slate. They've released tiles that look like... Um, you know, a terracotta, classic Californian and, and Mediterranean uh, roof style, a Provencal roof style, a whole lot. Pretty convincing, and every single tile generates electricity. And they reckon, they've done the, the maths, they think uh, that the cost of putting that in versus a traditional roof will quite cr quickly cross over. So it will become the norm. Everyone will have a solar roof, not crazy stupid looking panels that nobody wants to see just a normal roof. So I've picked on one company very quickly, but one of the things I haven't said about that company is that they just push ahead and release technology in a way that no one else does. So they suddenly made their cars autonomous. People said, oh, it's a decade away from it. They said, oh, by the way, we're doing it next week. And they laughed, they said, you can't do it next week. And they said, no, we have. And they've now released it, so you can buy a Tesla today and it will autonomously drive you from, let's say, Edinburgh to Dundee on the motorway. Um, they've not quite got through regulation yet to do door-to-door, -door, but they've shown it. You know, again, if you go online, you'll see a Tesla drive, press the button, it takes itself out of somebody's garage, opens the garage, drives out, picks the person up, takes them to work, drops them off at the door at work, and then goes and hunts for a parking space and parks. They're probably less than a year away from being capable of, rather than going away and parking, going away and picking up paying passengers around town and generating some cash for you while you're sitting in meetings. Now, that technology, which won't only be uh, you know, unique to, to Tesla, um, or is definitely not, will mean, and let's just jump to it, in 2030, driving will be a leisure pursuit. Driving will not be something you have to do because you need to get somewhere. Driving will not be a job. Driving will be a leisure pursuit. Think about that for a second. And this is where it gets into this whole point of we're living through this pace of change that's faster than any of us have ever lived through before. Pretty tough to comprehend. And actually, it's the slowest it'll ever be again. The pace of change, the rate of change is increasing pretty much exponentially year on year. And that will mean that 2030, you know, there will be no driving jobs. There's the flip side of this coin. What do we do with the workforce and the talent base, which actually over the past five years or so, because of the rise of home delivery and things like Amazon, 
we're employing far more people in driving jobs than we were 10 years ago. So we're creating a real kind of tidal wave of economic <coughs> challenge that's going to hit us pretty hard. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a small stepping stone towards a bigger end game. It'll probably be a bit beyond 2030, but by 2030, you'll see this, this out there. Right now, with a, a, what you would class as being designed with full Federal Aviation Authority uh, specifications, so a vehicle which can fly and from point to point still has enough redundancy and range to fiddle about if there's a problem and give you an extra half an hour of range. So the same as any commercial airliner, uh, they're starting to build autonomous passenger carrying drones, electrically powered, probably carry about four people, about 100, 150 miles. Uh, when those are deliverable, rural life changes completely. So these things will not cost a lot of money to operate. They'll operate on a kind of Uber model. You'll call for one and it'll come and pick you up and take you where you want to go. Infrastructure suddenly doesn't mean the same thing. We've just spent billions on the new fourth crossing. 20, 30 years time, we won't really need it anymore. Um, you know, it, it will come at such a pace that we will find it difficult to comprehend today, but it'll come. My last piece on Elon Musk, before I say a couple of other pieces um, around the technological future, is that Tesla would be pretty impressive for anybody to put on their CV and say, that's what I've done. Elon's not that kind of guy. He's also the chairman of SpaceX, which has effectively turned the space program in the US globally, actually, on its head. He delivers satellites into space cheaper and more effectively than anyone else can do. They laughed at me a year ago when he said he could land part of his booster section of his rocket on a moving platform on a ship in the Pacific. They laughed even more loudly when he failed three times and it fell into the ocean and you know, blew in its smithereens. They didn't laugh the fourth time when it landed perfectly, or the fifth time, or otherwise. And he kind of went, yeah, I was expecting it. Software takes a little bit of time to tweak. Now, dogma would be, you would sit in a lab and you would work this out and you would test it and you would test it because you couldn't possibly fail because your space program would be shut down. His dogma is, make it cheap enough that I don't care if it fails a few times because eventually we'll get it to work. And that's the new way. The new way is fail. Fail fast, get on with it and work out the solution. And if anybody has a problem with failure, they need to go somewhere else because we're going to fail. As long as we fail in a controlled environment, that means you know, humans don't get hurt, that means we don't go bust, we expect to fail and that's how we progress really quickly. And you'd think he'd stop there, saying, hey, SpaceX is going to launch more satellites, we're going to take people to Mars, we're going to do that. It's a pretty big vision. No, no, he hasn't stopped there. He's then said, listen, more short-range transport. It's crazy. Why aren't we building tunnels that are vacuumed um, and we can send, effectively, trains in those tunnels you know, faster than the speed of sound and cut London to Edinburgh. HS2, forget it. We can do this in like 15 minutes. Why can't we do that? And the answer is, well, you could do it if you could invent the technology. Oh, okay, let me take a bunch of folk out of SpaceX. They're pretty smart. Mining industry, give me the best machine you've got at tunnel boring. And they laughed at him and they said, well, we'll sell you this. It will cost you whatever it is, 20, 30, 40 million dollars. What are you going to do with it? He said, I know it's rubbish. It's the best you've been able to do in 100 years, but we're going to give it to the guys at SpaceX and they're going to reinvent a tunneling machine that will work 100 times more cheaply, 100 times more quickly than yours can, and we're going to develop one of these Hyperloop things on it. I think he'll have it done by 2030. I think they'll be open and they'll start connecting cities in a way that we can't possibly imagine today. So those things, and I've not gone into artificial intelligence, I've not gone into machine learning, but these kind of ultra-disruptive technologies, of which there are several on their way, are an existential challenge for any society. The way we live today, the way we work today, the way we play, the way we interact with each other, will look entirely different to us, unrecognisably so, inside 20 years. The smartphones you've all got in your pocket will be gone inside 10 years. They'll be replaced by Augmented reality displays, which mean you have a far more private browsing and, you know, laptops gone. You know, you'll, you'll see what you want to see at any particular time. You'll have wearable technology that's unobtrusive and doesn't make you look like an idiot, um, which is a key point. You know, if anybody remembers Google's uh, experiment with Google Glass, they did coin the phrase glass holes for people who wore them. Um, <laughs> So the industry understands it has to get past that and make this an acceptable part of normal life. It will do it and it will become so. 
Those technological changes will completely transform the way we're educated, the way we communicate, the way we interact on a daily basis. When communication virtually is a proper facsimile of communication physically, all sorts of barriers disappear and disappear almost overnight. In contemplating that, what do we do? Well, I think that's why I think whether it be national uh, interests in Europe, in Scotland, or otherwise, become way less relevant than dealing with this. And it does feel a bit like moving the deck chairs on the Titanic. We really need to deal with the iceberg. And the iceberg is this technological tidal wave uh, that's been pushed out in front of it. It's coming as fast as we can possibly imagine, yet faster, because that exponential thing means the tidal wave that's getting pushed is getting 10 times bigger every year. The things that are going to overcome us now. The only way we can deal with that is to look at how we develop our talent base. All these people that are driving today, how do we help them become really positive contributors to adopting and adapting that technology and making it work? Well, frankly, it's education. And it only is education. The only thing we can do is overfund education. And I don't believe we are. You know, I believe we are, we've got some fantastic ideas. You know, I will talk all night about why I think Curriculum for Excellence is a fantastic idea. It's just horrifically implemented. You can't do systemic change on a national scale like that and not put the budget in place to deliver it. Well, you can, and you get what we've got at the moment, uh, which is challenge around qualifications, you know, around it, challenge around how the teaching profession can possibly deliver the experience that this promises. You know, the two things don't quite match up. Technology will help us in that. You know, we do need to stand back and say, well, okay, well, let's not educate people in the way that we've always done it. Let's be quite radical. And it's going to need participation from every single citizen in this country if we're going to make it work. Um, it'll need open-mindedness. It'll need a, an approach to risk that we've never seen really in, in certainly in our lifetimes. And actually the prize is if we do that, we'll be one of the nations that sits above the line. And that's, to me, the only thing we have to worry about. There is a line with which everyone will be measured, which says, are you preparing yourself for what's to come? And the median line is, yeah, I'm kind of doing it, and I'm not really doing it particularly well. I'm sort of in the middle. Right now, I think we're below the line. If we can get ourselves above the line, we'll start to punch above our weight. We'll start to punch above the median globally. And if we become entrepreneurial in that, and that's the whole entrepreneurial Scotland ethos, if we, every single one of us, acts entrepreneurially, we'll continue to rise you know, and, and hit the top of that tide when it hits us with talent that can take advantage of it. And behind that educational focus really comes three things for me. Technical excellence is, is almost a given, you know, and you almost have to expect that every one of us has to become not a computer program, I'm not a software engineer, but technically excellent at adapting to what's coming, all the changes that are over the top. And actually the two places I think Scotland can excel are the next two important features that we need, which are creativity and innovation. It's all that really matters. Being able to recite facts doesn't really matter, because we can go to Google for facts most of the time. Um, you know, being able to uh, excel in an exam situation doesn't really matter. What matters is the ability to use your imagination, you know, the best of what we have in, in this country, to imagine a future and how you can apply these amazing ideas because machines can't do that. Machines, even with the best machine learning and artificial intelligence, do not display the kind of creativity and innovation that the human brain can, that our best universities can, that our best artists can, that our best school children can, that our best politicians, that our best people in every walk of life can. And that's what we've got to aspire to. And if we reward that, if we build on that, if we invest in that, then we'll adapt to it and we'll become one of the above the line countries. We'll do phenomenally well. If we don't, everybody below the line drowns, in my view. Everyone below the line. They inhabit countries that people might want to visit to spend a bit of money, but nobody wants to visit to make money. And it's not all about a capitalist dream, believe me. You know, I think there are all sorts of ways that our society will develop beyond that. But ultimately, let's not call it money. Let's call it wealth in the broadest sense. We need to be a country that generates wealth, 
not a country that people come to expend a little bit of it because then we're feeding off the leavings from the big, you know, the big countries' tables or the creative and innovative countries' tables, and that's not good enough for us. We need to be one of those countries that's out there creating this new brave world. And if we get it right by 2030, I can see a huge, fabulous future for Scotland. If we don't, and it's this existential, there'll be a, a long queue of people out the door. And some of that, to finish off, does go back to the short-term tactical. We clearly need to come out of this current period of turbulence with an enlightened society that can be dynamic and diverse in the people that we have here. You know, the demographic time bomb that we saw in Scotland kind of reversed in the past decade or so because of enlightened migration and great talent flocking to Scotland to make things work. If we see the end of that, I, I have a challenge understanding how we get above the line. So we can't. We simply can't. We need to work out how to keep that diversity, keep that dynamism, and inject even more creativity and innovation into, uh, in, into this country. We do that, all is well. The bleak part is we don't. Not many of us will be around to see it. Thank you. <laughs>